Hello and welcome to my five-part series on how to write murder mysteries that the layman can actually understand. Often in my own writing or basically in all the stories I've read on murder mysteries are either too complicated, too long, or too convoluted for the average reader to even have the opportunity to understand. And I'm a big fan of all sorts of murder mystery genres and writers, my favorite being Agatha Christie, and even she has problems with that, even if she is the best example of. So these five rules are not exhaustive. There's probably a lot more. These are the ones I've figured out. You can disagree with them and please do so because anyone can write detective fiction. It is the hardest thing to write, I think, to get things correct because there's so many elements in place. But hopefully these five elements that I'm bringing up now uh, will help you able to do so. So the first one is you must focus on a protagonist or one detective and one antagonist or one murderer. Now, how do you do that? Well, first we have to learn how to write in the first place. And to do so, we ask the master himself, Harlan Ellison. The, what you read is you read the Arthur Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes stories. You read the entire canon. They're not that many. You read the entire canon and you will be smarter than you ever need to be because every one of them is based on the idea of deductive logic. Keep your eyes open and be alert. That's what all good writing says. Wake up and pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention. That's all it is. That's what good writing is. Now, in my mind, detective fiction is one of the hardest stuff to write. The genre, the subgenre is not so much, but the main golden age of murder mysteries are difficult. So you have to know what rules in writing have to stay, what rules can be broken, and what, which rules can be bent to a degree. So think of it like, like jazz music. Jazz music requires the musician to know the classics. He has to know how to do scales and theory and history and all these other things and build himself up to be a jazz musicianist. And imagine performing jazz with other people in a, in a quintet or a quartet or even an orchestra. So it's like playing jazz music within an orchestra, only the opera is, is very small. So like an operetta or one movement of an opera. To me, that's how I would analogize detective fiction, or at least the detective fiction I'm gonna talk about today. So here's some lists of storytelling things that should be present in every story. We have a plot, we have a solid protagonist that grows throughout the story. We have an antagonist that grows throughout the story. We have some semblance of a dramatic structure, or if you like Gustav's Freytag uh, triangle, which focuses on the character growth of the main character and the antagonist. There's a resolution to the end of the plot, and it's usually written briefly. So there's not this long, giant novel series. It's just a quick story. If you're doing short stories, 20 pages. If you're doing a novella, 90 pages, 120 pages and you know what you're doing. Now, in a detective fiction story, the protagonist is static, he does not grow. The antagonist could grow, but essentially doesn't have to. And the dramatic structure behind that is pretty much gone. We're not focusing on the main characters, we're focusing on the suspects. So they can have a dramatic structure, they certainly can have their life continue on after a murder, and that's where you're allowed to be episodic. You can create your own characters, you can create your own worlds, and it's all contained within those characters. And that's fantastic. You can do that. That works totally fine. There's definitely resolution or else you know, it would be a horrible story if we didn't catch the criminal, we didn't know what happened. And of course, brevity is still being the soul of wit. You have to keep things concise. And that's one of the main lessons I want to give you here is when you create your stories, they have to be specific to what you're telling. You can't go off and world build for the sake of it. You can't start characterizing for the sake of it. You have to give the audience exactly what they need to figure out the puzzle. So in that regard, you cannot write a novel. Uh, you shouldn't. Uh, if you're writing a novel, that means you have a lot of exposition in a very, very big puzzle. We don't want a big puzzle. We want maybe at max, 14, 15 pieces to a puzzle. Think of a jigsaw puzzle, and that's that's as hot, that's more than enough. That's way more than enough. Anything beyond that, and you're you're killing your story, you're killing your puzzle, you're killing the ability for the layman to understand what you're doing. So, uh, now that we have an understanding of what a detective fiction story is and the story components, 
let's look at the protagonist itself. Now, the archetype of the detective in these stories is usually some sort of guy who's a private dick or a policeman, and he goes about solving a crime. The archetype is something or someone who is the wise man. He's above his peers in some way. And that's usually seen as the sage or the magician, which means the conflict in, or the main theme in a detective fiction story is reality versus reality. The reality of the detective and the reality of the murderer. And the murderer is saying, nothing to see here. It's not me. Maybe it's him. Maybe it's that person. I don't know. And the detective is saying, no, 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 it's you. So it's reality versus reality. It's not necessarily a cat and mouse game. It doesn't have to be that complicated. It doesn't have to be like, maybe it's this person then it gets switched around. No, it's too complex. Don't do that. It's the role of the detective to discover information. The three main things that the detective has to be, one of the three, is he has to focus on justice. The, the detective must be a justice seeker. He must always be striving to right the wrong, follow the law, follow his ethical code. The other one is honor. He's honoring his client who came to him. He's a private detective to solve the crime. He is honoring someone who died, a loved one, a family member, a friend, whomever. And the other one is the community. He's, he's here to bring a resolution to the community, to bring it, keep it safe, to bring it back to what it was. So those are the one of the three things they have to, they have to be. If you don't have that, then you end up having a vigilante or uh, some guy who's just doing something for the sake of it. He has no ethical compass and uh, you know, it could be anyone. You could get away with that if you know how to tell such a story, but classically that's not how it's done. Now, now that we have the archetype of the detective, there is also the archetype of the murderer. And in that regard, it doesn't really matter too much because the murderer can be anyone given enough time. A, a housewife or a, a maid can be a murderer. It's the puzzle that's the focus. And that's why the detective is called in because he has the, the mental capacity to figure these things out. So the detective's main function is to reveal information because he's the, he's the magician. He can, he can reveal reality to you. And if he's not revealing information, he is then implying the reveal of information or implying the connection between information or clues. So that's the, the role of the magician or the archetype of the magician is to uh, you know, pull back the curtain and say, look, they won't show you everything all at once and they will imply also what's behind the curtain as well. Okay, so we know what the role of the detective is and what, uh, uh, what the antagonist can be or the murder can be anyone. So let's look at how you actually tell that story based on what kind of detective you have. Now, there are three main kinds of detectives. There, there are many kinds in, in classical stories, but the three main ones that you're gonna think about would be the street smart detective or the gumshoe. And that's like uh, Archie Goodwin, Sam Spade, um, Philip Marlowe. Uh, they're they're the, the social guys. They like to talk to you, like to be your friends. They're friendly. They, they you know you scratch your back, I scratch mine, or I scratch your back, you scratch mine. So it's it's very friendly, and that's how you get the information. And if that's the kind of character you want, the detective, that means you're going to be writing a lot of dialogue. So, gumshoe, schmoozer, talker guy, dialogue. The second kind is the most uh, common. It's also the most boring but it's also the most concrete. It's called the empiricist or the, the, the scientist, uh, the doctor, um, you know, the forensic detective, I guess the specialist would be the doctor or the, uh, the coroner. And they're all throughout police procedural dramas. You see them, you've been seeing them for 60 years now on TV. So I'm not gonna list any, but uh, all kinds of descriptions would be your focus. If you're gonna have that kind of story. And I think just about every murder mystery will have at least one or two descriptions that are concrete, like the murder victim, the murder weapon, the location, etc., etc. So there's all these little physical details that are concrete and you have to understand why they're concrete or why they're empirical and whether or not they're real or whether it's a, a ruse. And we're not going to get into ruses because that's too much. So the third kind of detective is perhaps the more complicated and the more celebrated which is the person who focuses on the profile or the psychology of the individual 
which determines their behavior or their human behavior. So they say, okay, well, what kind of person would do this sort of thing? And that is closely related to motive, but mostly on the person and personality of the character. So you have Sherlock being able to do that, Auguste Dupin, uh, that's Poe's uh, famous detective, and of course, uh, Nero Wolfe and, uh, and Poirot. They are focusing mostly on human behavior and psychology. So if you have those kinds of stories or with those kinds of detectives, then there's going to be a lot of eccentric characters. There's going to be something strangely unique about one or two or three or maybe all of them and how they walk, how they talk, how they sound. And it's it's going to have to be very clear. So the idealized uh, strumpet, the idealized beggar, the idealized businessman, you know, something very concrete that everyone can relate to. It's like, okay, that's the person and we're going to describe him as such and he has a very astute way of sitting and talking and he orders his drink as such and he drinks as, as such. That's what you're focusing on, details of character behavior. Now there's always exceptions to these rules, but I mean, if, if you have more than one detective, so you have one detective who's good at talking and another who's good at uh, the, the, the mental aspect. So there's you know, Nero Wolf and Archie Goodwin. Uh, I guess you can say uh, Poirot and Captain Hastings, kind of. You wouldn't say stuff like Sherlock and, and Watson, but uh, Sherlock was pretty much a one-man team. Watson was just there for moral support as far as I remember the stories. Okay, so now that we have the detective, how you're going to tell the story with the detective, next you're going to be the proper usage of an antagonist. In reality, the antagonist is the puzzle. That's that's the thing where we're, we're in conflict over. We have to discover what the puzzle is. And usually when you think of an antagonist in classical sense, it's, it's usually someone who's better than the protagonist and they have to grow and, and you know, overcome them somehow. So they have to go through a, a phase of growth. Whereas in detective fiction, the, the detective is already established. And he has to, he's the one who's called in to put something together that no one else can see. So the challenge is the puzzle. It's not specifically the Moriarty. And let's be honest, Moriarty wasn't in too many stories in Sherlock. He was just a, a math professor. Uh, there's like Poirot's main, you know, the, the worst person he's ever met they had to be challenged against was uh, Stephen Norton, I think. And he was in one story, Curtain. So it wasn't like, d detectives don't need a, insurmountable mastermind they need an intricate puzzle that is actually not so much an intricate puzzle it's just in pieces and that's one of the reasons why i'm doing this is i want people to understand that the puzzle doesn't have to be blown up complicated it has to be actually really simple for the the audience to understand so that's what i'd like the the antagonist or the murderer to be it's actually the puzzle itself and that should be clear in your description so if the the murderer is talkative you're going to have a lot of, of social clues, a lot of dialogue. If the, the murderer has an intricate uh, you know, locked room scenario with levers and, and string and whatnot, it's going to be empirical, lots of descriptions, uh, mechanical engineering, chemistry, physics, whatever scientific basis you want to go with your descriptions, it's fine. Or if it's psychological, lots of descriptions on human behavior, how they walk, how they talk, uh, how they sing, that sort of stuff. So that's my part one. Thank you very much. I appreciate your comments. And please tell me what you think of your number of ways to tell an appropriate murder mystery story that you can understand.